This evening, uh, we have been going through Zechariah, but I thought uh, that tonight would be a good night nice seeing as it is the 4th of July. I, I did this presentation about five or six years ago, <laughs> and uh, it hasn't changed uh, because things really haven't changed too much. If they have, they've changed for the worse, but still things are the same. The United States of America, born on the 4th of July, the sacred and the secular, God's founding and purpose for our nation. I believe that God has a purpose and had a purpose for the United States from before the beginning of the foundation of the earth. I really do. Uh, and, and we'll discuss that as we go on. The, now, there were a number of people that came here. Now, watch this thing. It's going to freeze up on me. Isn't that, isn't that the first people to come here from Europe. How many, people, how many people know who the first one to come to North America from Europe was? Any, uh, any guesses? Yeah. Well, the Norse, Leif Erikson. Have you heard of Leif Erikson? He was here about 1000 AD. He settled up around Canada, Newfoundland, and up around there. He, and he didn't really settle, he explored. And then, of course, the next one was Christopher Columbus, 1492. And again, he, uh, he never came to the American mainland, but he was in the Caribbean. <laughs> and there were a number of other explorers that came to the New World and explored, but the first settlements that we're concerned about, really the first, the, the, the foundation of our, of our nation, really happened when the first uh, British settlements came. And their motivation, the initial stated motivation of the people that came to this country from England was evangelism. And we're going to see that. We're going to read some, <laughs> some portions of some things that they wrote. But it says in Romans chapter 10, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher... And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings uh, uh, and of good things. The initial motivation, there was, a, I believe, a sincere desire to preach the gospel. They knew that there were people living on this continent. They knew that they, were, they would call them savages, of course, the Indians wouldn't have said that about themselves. They had their own kind of culture and civilization. But the Christians of England had a heart. One of their, one of their motivations was to, to preach the gospel over here. Now, the first settlers that really we're concerned with are the ones that settled in Jamestown. Anybody ever been down around Newport News in Virginia? My, my brother-in-law, Rose's brother, lives in Hampton, and we were... We were there at Jamestown and, and those places where they first settled. In 1607, settlers came to Jamestown. And they did so at behest of this fellow. I'm not going to try to pronounce his name. He was an Anglican priest, and he made a study of navigation, and he encouraged King James, the same one of Bible fame, to colonize the New World. He uh, said this, if it will come up. His reasons were, come on, I love it when it does this. He says, our primary end is to plant religion. Their first desire was to spread the Christian faith. But they had another desire. Our secondary and subalternative ends are for the honor and profit of our nation. So the endeavor was not only an evangelical one, it was also, it was also a business endeavor. They were looking... Initially, they went looking for the, a trade route to the uh, East Indies. But they were looking for, you know, exports and crops and gold and uh, whatever else they could find over here. He said, first to preach and baptize into Christian religion and by the propagation of the gospel to recover out of the arms of the devil a number of poor and miserable souls wrapped up unto death in almost invincible ignorance. And that, he was talking about the Indians. Now again, if you would have talked to the Indians, they probably would not have said that about themselves. But the people from England, the, the civilized, quote-unquote, people from England saw 
that uh, these Indians were, they saw them as savages. He goes on and he says, to endeavor the fulfilling and accomplishments of the number of the elect which shall be gathered from out of all corners. There's a little Calvinism flavor in there. And add to our might the treasury of heaven. So they wanted to evangelize the Indians. Maybe they just didn't go about it the way they should have. Uh, King James I said this, We greatly commend and graciously accept their desires for the furtherance of so noble a work, which may, by the providence of Almighty God, hereafter tend to the glory of His divine majesty, in propagating of Christian religion to such people as yet live in darkness. He was, his desire was, his stated desire was, to spread the gospel. Now, of course, there was this underlying, and, you know, see what we can get. And the thing is, when they came here, when they came here and they wanted to spread the gospel, they would like go to the Indians, tell them the gospel, then push them off their land, you know, which is not a good way to do that. But that's what they were doing. Now, when they first landed on Jamestown, and this was, this was again, 406 years ago, they prayed. The Reverend Robert Hunt, who was the chaplain of that group that came here in 1607, he prayed that from these very shores, they, 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 they came upon the shore and they set up a cross. There's, a, there's an artist rendition there. From these very shores, the gospel shall go forth to not only this new world, but the entire world. So this Reverend Hunt prayed, and I believe God has answered that prayer, that the United States, well, he wasn't thinking of the United States at that time, but that North America would be a place where the gospel would go forth, not only to the people of North America, but back out into the rest of the world. How many people know that prayer was answered? That prayer has been answered. Of the 105 original people that went to Jamestown, only 35 survived the first winter. Okay. Now, if we go a little further nor north, the first settlers to settle in Massachusetts were the pilgrims, and that's the ones we associate with Thanksgiving and the Puritans and so forth, and that was in 1620. Uh, this is an excerpt from the Mayflower Compact where it says, In the name of God, we whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord, King James, by the grace of God of England, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. You see, we read this over and over again that their, that their desire, their stated desire was to spread the gospel. That was their purpose. And that's what they began to do. They had very good intentions, but they had a very questionable agenda. Okay. Because their intention of spreading the gospel was good, but, again, they would move in and, uh, you know, take land. Uh, uh, King James, when he uh, signed the compact for the, the Jamestown colony, he talked about spreading the gospel and winning the, the heathen to the Lord and so forth. Then he, like, parceled out land that wasn't his to give. You know, and uh, if you talk, there's a lot of Indians that don't celebrate Thanksgiving because they kind of got the raw end of the deal. They could have evangelized them without stealing off of them. You know, they could have done that, but they didn't. But the thing is, was God's hand in this? See, I'm, I'm trying, I, I want us to understand that, that God has had his hand on the founding of the United States of America. Because if you read the stories about these settlers, and there's a story of... Uh, the Indian Squanto. Have you ever heard that story? There was an Indian who was captured about three or four years before the pilgrims got there. There was, a, there was an expeditionary force and they, they uh, captured some Indians and they brought them back to Spain to sell them as slaves. And one of them got out of that and ended up coming back to his tribe in Massachusetts after learning English. And when the, when the pilgrims came there, they got there and there was this Indian that was speak, speaking English to him, you know. And he helped them. He was like a liaison and so forth. So, and so there's so many stories like that, that God has had his hand on the founding of this nation. They had good intentions, but they had a questionable agenda. Now we know that the word says this. Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. And Paul wrote in 1 Timothy, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through 
with many sorrows. This mission, this evangelistic mission turned into a business venture. And I have listed some events from the time of the Pilgrims, which is 1620, to the time of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, which was our birthday, was uh, from 1620 to 1776, so that's like 150 years or so, so forth. Uh, just some events, fireworks, okay. In 1616, tobacco became a major export. Aren't you glad they discovered tobacco? <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Uh, they didn't have any tobacco in the old world before. Okay. America knows how to export stuff, don't we? Okay. Okay. In 1619, the first slaves were sold in Virginia. 1619. Didn't take them long, did it? 1626, a Dutch colonist buys Manhattan for 24 bucks. I wonder if he wanted his money back. All right. Okay. They started founding schools. They started uh, developing uh, places of education, higher learning, even colleges. The Bible was a major part of their curriculum. The Bible, which is illegal in school now, was really was their primer, was their, was their reading book back then. That's what they used. Uh, Many came from Europe to escape religious intolerance and so forth. They found freedom in the New World. In 1646, those great Calvinists up in Massachusetts made religious heresy punishable by death. Falling after their buddy John Calvin. That's what he was doing in Geneva. If you didn't play his game, you didn't play. All right. Uh, come on now. In 1660, the Navigation Act, the British passed this act that said only the British could ship things out of the colonies. No French, no Spanish, just the British. They started to begin to get kind of a chokehold on things. In 1664, Maryland passed a law that made lifelong servitude for blacks mandatory. That means, that means if you were black and you lived in Maryland, you were a slave. And there was no chance or no, no, not even an inkling of a chance of ever getting your freedom. It was mandatory by law. See, it's kind of like a mixed, mixed bag here that we're getting. In 1672, the Royal Africa Company is given exclusive rights in the slave trade. Come on. In 1692, the Salem Witch Trials. We've heard of them. Twenty people were executed, accused of witchcraft. See, this is why I'm kind of glad. I kind of believe in the separation of church and state. <laughs> I really do. Okay. 1700, Massachusetts passes a law ordering all Catholic priests to leave the colony for fear of life imprisonment or death. The Catholic priest. New York does the same. Come on. 1702, Maryland establishes the Anglican Church as the official church and is supported by taxes on all free men, male servants and slaves. Somebody might say, well, that sounds good. Well, it wouldn't sound good if you weren't an Anglican. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you were something else. All right. Man, I wish this thing would work. 1705, in Virginia, slaves are assigned the status of real estate by the Black Code. In New York, a law against runaway slaves assigns the death penalty for those caught over 40 miles north of Albany. Man, they weren't, they weren't playing around. Okay? In 1712, Pennsylvania, praise the Lord, assembly banned the import of slaves into the calling. So we see what's happening here. There's, the states are starting to disagree with one another. Even then, this was before the Civil War, over slavery. Some said it was all right. Uh, some said it was not right. Uh, it, in some places, they needed the slaves to be able to make a buck. It was an, an economical thing. It had nothing to do with human rights or anything like that. Okay. We're getting there. 1740, 50 black slaves are hanged in Charleston, South Carolina after plans for a revolt. This wasn't a lynching. This was an official hanging. Okay. 
Between 1750 and 1770, a number of laws are enacted by Parliament to severely limit and restrict the American economy. Taxes on imported goods increase. The colonies are forbidden to print and issue legal currency. Now we're getting down to where the rubber meets the road here. Business and economy. Money. Power. Control. In 1770, 65, the Stamp Act was issued. The first direct taxation of the colonies. This is what spawned the Boston Tea Party. This is where you ever heard the phrase, taxation without representation is tyranny. They were taxing them, but they didn't have any say-so in Parliament. Almost kind of like what's going on now. But no, we, okay. Okay, in... 1774 was the first Continental Congress when they got together and said, you know, we've got to do something about this. And you can't blame them. They weren't allowed to print money. They weren't allowed to do business. They were being taxed to death. They couldn't, they, just like today, they couldn't print their own money. They, they, they couldn't, uh, they were bound. Their hands were tied. And the leaders of the states got together and said, you know what, we can't go on with this. We just can't keep on surviving like this. Okay. So the Founding Fathers got together and they began to plan a revolt against England. Now, some of the Founding Fathers, and there are many of them, there were 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence. And there were many more men who were involved in the Revolutionary War. And we've, we've heard this where people will talk about all these Christians that were the, our Founding Fathers. They were all Christians. Well, you know, let's look. John Adams. He was a Unitarian. He, he didn't believe in the Trinity. See, these, these men believed in God. They weren't atheists. They believed, their, they believed in the God of the universe. They weren't atheists, but many of them rejected the God of the Bible. Okay? They were moral men in that sense. They believed there was a God who created things and that, who set up inalienable rights that we're going to read about in a minute. <laughs> John Adams was a Unitarian. His brother Samuel Adams, they were considered sons of the Revolution, was a Unitarian. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. He, again, he believed in God. He was raised in, in Episcopalian, but he believed in God, but he denied Christ. We'll talk about him in a minute. Uh, John Hancock, the, sign, the first signer of the Declaration of Independence, was a Congregationalist. He was a Mason. Benjamin Franklin, he was a deist. He was a Mason. George Washington was an Episcopalian. He was a Mason. Paul Revere, you know, the midnight rite of Paul Revere, a Unitarian, denied the Trinity, was a, was a Mason. They, they all believed in God, but many of them were Masonic. Now, there were other Christians, Patrick Henry and some others, who were genuinely, you know, Christian. And some of these might have been too. I don't know. You know, it's, I wasn't there. I didn't know them. <laughs> but one thing for sure that George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, they were sort of like the the, the main three, they were all Masonic. Which means they believed in a God, but they weren't allowed to say Jesus in the Masonic Lodge. You know that? Masons, they're not allowed to use the word Jesus when they're in the Masonic Lodge. Okay? Now, now these, these are men, they believe in God. Okay? In April 19, 1775, what we call the shot heard around the world, the beginning of the Revolutionary War, Lexington, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. That started the revolt. It, a lot of people think it started with the Declaration of Independence. It didn't. It started over a year before that. That started the fighting. And finally, July 4, 1776, the Declaration of Independence is signed and sent. Now, when they got together with the Continental Congress. I believe it was the Third Continental Congress. When they, when, they, when they drafted the Declaration of Independence, there were five men who were appointed to, to bring up, to, to, have, to concoct the Declaration of Independence. But there was really only one man who really wrote the draft, and that's Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was a brilliant man. He was a, come on, he was a man of great intelligence and learning. He was a scientist, a deist. Again, we talked about uh, what he believed. He was raised an Episcopalian, 
but he ended up denying the deity of Jesus Christ. He thought Jesus was a good man, a great teacher, uh, a moral man, and he wrote his own Bible. And when he wrote his own Bible, he took the gospel stories, took out the miracles, took out the virgin birth, took out the, the resurrection, and just talked about Jesus' moral teachings. Because that's who he thought Jesus was, a great moral teacher. He, he hated the gospel. He thought that Paul, the apostle Paul and the other apostles, perverted the gospel for their own, for their own gain's sake. So he, he despised the teaching of, of Paul and, you know, the book of Romans and all that. He despised that. He despised the gospel. But he liked Jesus. He thought he was a good guy. When he wrote the Declaration of Independence, deity is mentioned four times. The word Jesus is never used, okay? See, now I've said this because I've, I just read something, and I always read this. Everybody says, well, you know, our, Bible, our, our, our government and our nation is based on Christian principles. And I just have trouble finding that. It's based on God, maybe godly principles. They were godly men. They believed in God. They believed in right and wrong. They believed there was a God to determine what was right and what was wrong. But they didn't believe in Jesus. Okay? The first place where God is mentioned. And I don't know if, how many of you have ever sat down and actually read the Declaration of Independence. It's a list of grievances against, against the, the, the throne, against the crown. It's basically they're saying, you know what, we've got to separate from you. And, and you know, the, 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 the leaders, the, the founding fathers, initially, they really didn't want to separate from England. They wanted to get along with England. They didn't want to necessarily be an independent nation. But they were really just kind of forced into this position. When in the course of human events, it says, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Now listen, listen to what he's saying. Listen to these principles. I don't, I don't think they're biblical principles. Does God entitle us? To the, you know, we talk about entitlement mentality. <laughs> it's nothing new. The powers of the earth... And the, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. In other words, he's saying, listen, when it gets to the point when we can't agree with one another, we're gone. And God says it's all right to do that. Now remember, Jefferson isn't talking about the God of the Bible because he doesn't really believe in the God of the Bible. He believes in nature's God. That's a Masonic concept. The grand architect of the universe, okay? Read with me a little bit more. Nature's God. Jefferson supported the moral teachings of Jesus, but denied his deity. We talked about that. Uh, we talked about that. He was raised Episcopalian and so forth, but he gave up on that. He rejected organized religion, but supported the right of all to believe what they felt was right. Okay? The next place in the Declaration where he mentions deity, he says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. See, now when I read that, and basically he's saying, hey, everybody should understand this, that all men are created equal. I said, well, that's good. Why did he have slaves? You, you know, I mean, and, well, he had slaves because he wouldn't have been able to make a living without them. See, the economy thing came into play, okay? But he says, all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator, he believed in creation, with certain unalienable rights, that means rights that nobody can take from us, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Well, life, you know, the role of government, if you read the Bible, and you can maybe draw these scriptures down and look them up, the role of the Bible, number one, is to keep law. Let's read them while we're here. We're not, you know, we're not too late, I think. Somebody, somebody find Romans chapter 13 uh, and read verses 1 through 6. Somebody want to help me out here a little bit? Find Romans chapter 13 and read verses 1 through 6. The Human government. Life. Keep law and order. Keep order in a society. You know, so I heard somebody talking on the TV, uh, on, on the radio, 
that they want to put up cameras at red lights to see if you go through a red light. You hear that? And people were crying and saying, whoa. And the guy said, if you don't want to get a ticket, don't go through the red light. <laughs> you know, obey the law. You won't have to worry about it, okay? The role of government is to keep law and order, to punish evildoers and reward those who do right. And that was in that passage. But somebody wants to grab 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, just two verses. Maybe we'll just read them tonight. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Submit yourselves. Do what's right and be a witness. Now, when Peter wrote that, they had Nero. Okay? So, you know, it's to punish evildoers and reward those who do right. Okay? Now, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Does somebody find in the Bible where it says, I'm entitled as a human being? You know, listen, in Christ, I have those things in Christ. All those things are in Christ. Come on. Life. <laughs> life and more abundantly in John 10.10. 10. I have life in Christ. The government can't give me life. I have liberty. I have, I have freedom. Paul says, you know, we have liberty in Christ. If you read Galatians chapter 5, it talks about, you know, don't use your liberty for license. Well, we have liberty in Christ. You could be in a prison and have life and liberty. You know, David Berkowitz, son of Sam, he's in jail. He has more freedom than some folks do on the outside because he's in Christ. Okay, but it doesn't come from the government. Happiness, God will make us, he'll give us happiness. There's some scriptures you can write down and read and check them out. But it doesn't come from the government. Okay, now. <clears throat> he says in that passage that the government derives their just powers from the consent of the governed. Where's that in the Bible? In other words, what he's saying is, well, God created government so the people can, rule, can, can determine what the government's like. Just what that passage that, that Todd read, and, what, and, and from Proverbs, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. It's God that gives the power to the leader. He never meant for the leader to get their power from the people. It's God that gives the authority. It's God that sets up and takes down. It's God that gives the power. He goes on and he says this, We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in General Con Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intention. In other words, we're calling God, straighten these things out. Well, they had a beef. They were kind of up against it. Now, somebody's probably thinking in their head, well, is God for it or is he against it? We're going to get there. We are. I promise. I promise. Okay. The supreme judge of the world. In Jefferson's theology, in his theology, God can't be known. God was this power out there. He was like the big watchmaker that kind of just started everything going. And he gave us rules and he gave us laws and he gave us a conscience. But God was out there. You couldn't know him in the person of Jesus Christ. He didn't think that Jesus was God. He believed that God was on his side, and I believe that God was on his side too. His idea of human government, his idea of the ideal, ideal human government was a Republican democracy like we live in, where the people vote, and they elect representatives, and they elect a president. Do you know that initially, when they designed our government, the president was not supposed to be elected by a popular vote? The, the, the people would have vote would elect representatives and senators, and they were the ones who were supposed to elect the president. Because the people raised such an uproar, it became a popular vote. That's where the electoral, the electoral, the electrical, the electoral college came from. It, initially, they, the, 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 the general population wasn't supposed to vote for the president. But a, a Republican democracy, a representative democracy. In Jefferson's mind, in the mind of the people of his time, that's a perfect government. But is that the perfect government in God's eyes? No. I'll tell you what his perfect government is. A monarchy. You mean God wants us to have a king? God wants us to have the king of kings. If you go back to Daniel chapter 2 and you read that chapter, that's where, where Nebuchadnezzar had the dream of the, the great statue. The head was made of gold. We've talked about this before when we were going through the book of Daniel. The head was made of gold, 
and the head represented King Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian Empire. In the Babylonian Empire, what the king said, that was it. He didn't have to answer to anybody. His word was law, and he could change his mind anytime he wanted to. The next kingdom was the, the kingdom of silver, was the Medo-Persian. Their king was powerful, but he had laws he had to obey. And you, again, you can read in Daniel, that king off, uh, gave an edict, but he couldn't change it according to the law of the Persians. Got diminished a little bit. The next kingdom was the Grecian kingdom, and that statue, that was the kingdom of brass. You notice how gold and silver, the, the metals get less valuable. The kingdom of brass, uh, Alexander the Great was the, the, the king of uh, Greece, but they had a senate, they had, and the same is true with the Roman Empire, the final empire. They had a senate, they had elections and so forth. And finally, at the very bottom of that statue, what were they? There were, there were feet made of iron and what? And clay. And it says right there in Daniel that the clay represents the seed of men. See, I believe that's democracy. I really do. People say, I, I thank God I live in a democracy. But God's, God's idea of perfect government is not democracy. When Christ reigns, he is not going to have a senator or a congress. He's not going to have elections. He's going to sit on a throne. He's going to be the king of kings and lord of lords. But in Jefferson's idea, or the, the idea of those men, see, people say these are biblical uh, principles. I don't believe they were biblical principles. They were enlightenment principles, which was different than biblical, okay? All right. The final place where the deity appears in the Declaration of Independence. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor. Now, we've gone through the Declaration of Independence, or parts of it, and we've seen that they appealed to deity. A few weeks ago, we were talking about when George Washington was first inaugurated as president. He went to the, the church, which is located in the corner of Ground Zero, and he prayed to God. And how God preserved that church there at 9-11. We talked about that. And God, I was saying, it was like God was saying, hey, you remember when you prayed to me to bless your nation? I believe that God heard these men, even though they weren't Christians. And somebody might say, well, that doesn't make sense. How can God hear a... Here, here a, 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 pagan, a pagan leader. If you look in the Old Testament, when God allowed the nation of Israel to be carried captive into the nation of what? Babylon, remember that? He called Nebuchadnezzar, who was a heathen king, he called him his servant. He used Babylon for his purpose. Nebuchadnezzar eventually got saved, I believe, if you read... Daniel uh, chapter 4. I believe he got saved. Because God humbled him. But uh, in, in Isaiah, God talks about King Cyrus, who was a Persian king, who sent the, 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 allowed the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall and rebuild the temple. God called Cyrus his servant, a heathen king. See, I really believe, you know, everybody talks about oh, all these guys were Christians. They weren't Christians, but God used them. God had a purpose for all of this. The purposes, purposes for our nation, our sacred heritage, we have a sacred heritage. See, I won't go around and say, well, we're a, we're a Christian nation. We're a nation maybe with a bunch of Christians in it at one time. But the founding fathers, when they crafted, if you look through the Constitution, they wanted a nation, a government that was separate from any church. Now, they weren't supposed to hinder the practice of religion. Now, the problem is today is the government's trying to hinder the practice of religion. They've gone, they've gone over that. They've gone over that boundary. But we have a sacred heritage. I believe that God prepared this place. He answered the prayer of that, of that, uh, that Reverend Hunt when they landed in Jamestown. He answered his prayer. This is a place where Christianity has flourished over the last 400 years. It's flourished. Unlike any other place in the world. Christianity has grown. It has been the place where the gospel has gone forth. Missionary efforts. A source of the gospel to the world, just like that brother prayed on Jamestown Beach. It has been that. We've been a friend to Israel. 400 years before there even was an Israel, God was preparing a friend to Israel. Because at the time of this, there was no Israel. Until 1948. 
We've been a friend to Israel. We've had personal freedom to make choices. Thank God that we have freedom to make choices. We can choose to do good, or we can choose not to do good. We can choose to believe in God, or we can choose not to believe in God. We don't have some government standing over us telling us what we can or can't believe. Not yet, anyway. They want to. They want to. Because what is happening is, the ideal of our founding fathers has begun to wither. What is the baggage that we have? Our secular baggage? Materialism? We go all the way back to whenever they were buying and selling slaves, they were talking about all men are created equal and they had slaves. Because it was all about money and stuff. And that has, that has manifested itself tremendously today, materialism. Lukewarm Christianity, my goodness. That's all a message in itself. We want to dominate the world. The United States, not quite like we think, but you know this idea of democracy everywhere? That whole mess over there in Iran? They wanted to establish democracy. So they got people to vote. I remember the first time that people voted. Everybody was saying, oh, how great. You know, they were putting their finger in the ink thing. As soon as the soldiers start leaving, they start killing each other again. Because you can't have democracy unless people have principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Islam, do, Islam doesn't have those principles. They don't have that. But yeah, we want, we want American democracy to be all over the world. Come on. Sexual immorality and unbridled lust. Look at our nation. Look at our culture. What are we exporting now? We're no longer exporting the gospel. We're exporting pornography. In a big way. Political corruption and ultimately our government has got to a place where we no longer believe in the supreme being that cares about what we do. Our founding fathers did. They might not have all been Christians, but they believed there was a God that was going to hold them accountable to something. We don't have that anymore. I don't know how many leaders we have in Washington who really believe there's a God that cares about what they do. I don't know how many are there. You see, I really believe that God prepared this nation. He's had, he had his hand on the founding of this nation. He's had his hand on the, on the uh, protection and the prosperity of this nation for the purpose of spreading the gospel, of being a friend to Israel of being a place where Christianity can flourish. And you know what? All those things are beginning to diminish. Just like in Babylon. He prepared Babylon for a place where his people, he would put his people for 70 years because they practiced idolatry. And it was actually an act of mercy because had he not done that, he, he would have had to have wiped them out. <laughs> so he let them go into captivity for 70 years. And there was a king there named Nebuchadnezzar, and I believe Nebuchadnezzar got saved. But toward the end of the Babylonian captivity, uh, toward the end of the, the Babylonian empire, there was another king named Belshazzar. You read about this in Daniel chapter 5. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar had been dead for years. Belshazzar, I believe, was his grandson. And he was, uh, he was in charge. And he was having a big party. And he was taking all the sacred vessels that Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple. And he was mocking God. And he was making light of uh, the God of wood and the God of gold and the God of silver. He was making a joke out of the gospel. And you know what happened at that party he was having? He looked up and he saw a man writing on a, a finger writing on the wall. You know that story? You know you hear the, the term, the writing's on the wall? I want to tell you something, the writing is on the wall. Because just like God got done with Babylon, unless things change in this country, God's going to be done with us as a nation. God's going to be done with us as a nation. The writing's on the wall. We're turning our back on Israel. We're, we're, we're eliminating God from every public thought. You know, they're taking down the manger sets and the Ten Commandments and everything else. 
We're turning our back on God. We're, the life is no longer precious in this country. For, we're going further and further and further down the road. And there's going to come a time when their writing's going to be on the wall if things don't change. See, here's the thing. Somebody might say, well, what's the... What do we do? You got an election coming up? I believe we ought to participate in elections and politics. We ought to do everything we can as citizens of the United States to express our, what we feel is right, to, to pray and do what God wants us to do. But ultimately, here's what it comes down to. I go back to Nebuchadnezzar. Remember Nebuchadnezzar built a statue? And he said, when the music starts, I want everybody to be on their faces. That's what's happening today. You know, the, you know we, got, we got a government now that's telling you what you have to buy. It's, it's, it's trying to tell churches, it's trying to tell the Catholic Church that they, they, they have to provide things they don't believe in. And it's only a matter of time before it happens here. What's the solution? When, they, when that music starts and everybody else bows, believers got to stand. You got to say, I'm not bowing down. I'm not bowing down to your idol. I'm not going to bow down. Put me in the furnace. Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, if you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you in the furnace. You know, the three Hebrew boys said, go ahead. Throw us in. Throw us in the furnace. Go ahead. Do what you got to do. Throw us in jail. Take the tax exemption. Take the building. Do whatever you want. I'm going to stand on, on God's word. That's what we have to do. We have to get back to God's word. Christians in this nation got to get back to God's word and get ready to stand. As things are happening in this nation, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, all of them, if they could see what's going on today, they would probably scream a fit. They didn't expect for that. I don't believe if for, any, for a minute that they expected things to be like it is here today. I never thought they, I, I don't think for a minute they would think that the, 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 the government of the United States would be able to tell the people of the United States what they had to buy. You've got to buy this. But you see, a nation who derives its power from the people when the people get rotten, the power gets rotten. That's why we need a revival. That's why we need people to get saved. Because when you can get a population in tune with Jesus Christ, then you know what? They're not going to vote for unrighteousness. That's why our, our, our hope isn't in the Democrat Party or the Republican Party. Our hope is in the blood of Jesus Christ. Anyway, God bless America. Pray for our leaders. I'm glad I live in America. I'm so glad I don't live like, you know. I'm glad I live in America. It breaks my heart sometimes. Somebody was saying this, and I'm closing, but uh, that... When, you know, when 9-11 happened and a couple days after all the, all the Congress stood on the steps of the Congress and saying, God bless America. I wonder if God was weeping or throwing up. Because I wonder how many of them guys, how many of those men and women really, really believed what they were singing. You know. I thank God I have a citizenship in heaven. Amen. Amen. Praise Anybody have any comments or questions before we close that? Yes.